Nowadays, the world is facing the catastrophic threat named Kaiju. They can appear anywhere, anytime in the world to wreak havoc. Pushed into a situation that could spell doom at any moment, humans have invented modern weapons to combat these giant monsters. Not only that, they also have heroes with special powers stepping up to protect humanity. Immediately, brave warriors are deployed, directly targeting weaknesses and delivering decisive blows. All coordinate swiftly to prevent further damage to the city. While the world is following the footsteps of these warriors, behind the scenes, those specialized in cleaning up dead bodies have also arrived to collect samples and process the deceased monsters. Our protagonist, Kafka, is also one of the members of this cleanup crew. Unnoticed and uncared for, they still work diligently to mitigate the consequences caused by the dead monster carcasses. Although they are dead, there are still many dangerous things, which makes this a silent battle for warriors like them. At one point, a newcomer who knew nothing suddenly lifted a pile of internal organs filled with corrosive substances. Fortunately, Kafka warned him in time, helping him to save his life. It was estimated that it would take more than a week to clean up that slimy mess, and regular overtime made everyone feel tired. Being a long-time worker, he was assigned to do the harder parts. Especially the part containing various things in the world that the monster had eaten but had not yet expelled. Even though he didn't want to, he had to endure it and try to finish it to go home and rest. Its nauseating smell made him not want to eat anything. On TV, they were also reporting about the team captain of the third team, Mina, a great female warrior of the country. She was also the childhood friend who lost her family and loved ones along with Kafka. However, their current lives were like heaven and earth, so they had lost contact. The next day, when Kafka arrived at work, he was assigned to a new recruit, Ichikawa, who aimed to get into the combat force, just like Kafka did before, except that he had given up that dream because he felt too weak and had no talent, so he ended up here. Ichikawa also vowed never to give up to get out there and fight. On his first day at work, he was assigned to the gutting team. Kafka was happy, but he was forced to become the instructor for Ichikawa, which made him so angry that he wanted to punch the team captain, but he had to accept it because the captain had higher authority. On Ichikawa's first day gutting, he felt the disgusting stench inside, and usually, they wouldn't need anything if they were in charge of this part unless they wanted to vomit. Instead, Kafka also gave Ichikawa a type of supplement drink that provided everything necessary for the body. Thanks to Kafka's dedicated help, Ichikawa also became better. That day was also the last day they gutted, so the next few days would be easier. Ichikawa also came to thank Kafka for helping him get through this dirty first day. It seems like he knows that this older brother still wants to join the defense force, he also updates Kafka with new information about the age limit for registration, which has been raised to 33. This year Kafka is not yet 30, so he can still register to fight as he initially wanted. Hearing words of encouragement from his younger brother, he is very happy. But he is saddened when right after that, a monster appeared and attacked. It was really dangerous as they both became its target immediately. Fortunately, Kafka quickly saved Ichikawa twice within a minute. Knowing that both couldn't die in vain, Kafka told Ichikawa to run and call for help, while he himself led the monster elsewhere. After all, he had dreams of becoming a warrior before, so his skills were quite good, knowing what to do to save himself. As soon as he cut off the monster's tail, Kafka jumped down from above, remembering the memories of the days before when he and Mina lost everything precious. They set a goal to become warriors of the defense force with the belief that they would together eradicate the monsters, protecting peace for the country. The promise made when they were young, Mina had fulfilled, while Kafka could only be a cleanup crew member. The monster still followed him, forcing him to take risks, but how could he fight such a big creature? While holding only an iron rod in his hand, Kafka was hit by it, seemingly smiling for his reincarnation in the next life. Fortunately, nearing death, Ichikawa didn't abandon his elder brother. And he came back to respond. No matter how they fought, they would win, if the opponent was human, this might be true, but this was a monster, so even with 10 more people, they couldn't win. Knowing this, Kafka tried to persuade Ichikawa to run away, but he wouldn't leave. This time, the captain of the third team, Mina, and White Tiger appeared to respond. In just one shot, she killed the monster and then called for cleanup. Kafka only felt relieved when he was taken to the emergency room, his organs were intact, but his legs were injured. Thinking about being saved by Mina made him quite sad because he hadn't even caused a scratch to that monster. Ichikawa lying next to him also had to thank him again. Without him, he probably wouldn't be alive and well now. Being praised as heroic, Kafka felt somewhat comforted. Encouraged, he also reminded himself that he had to continue to fulfill his dream. Just as he was feeling a bit happy, a strange monster appeared, saying that he couldn't escape, and then it suddenly lunged at Kafka's mouth, while Kafka couldn't do anything. This monster didn't kill him but transformed him into the ultimate form of a real monster. Ichikawa heard a strange noise and peeked out to see the scene before him, thinking maybe he should have died earlier in the morning. 
Fortunately, Kafka still maintained consciousness in his kaiju form and called for his younger brother's help. But the two brothers were discovered by an old man, who immediately reported to the defense force, causing both to panic and search for a way to escape before being captured by the defense force. Memories of the past between him and Mina resurfaced, when they lived happily relying on each other. Although they lost all their relatives, Kafka was always a support for Mina to overcome the pain. When she received news of a monster at the hospital, she also prepared to fight alongside her team, all equipped with weapons aimed at the location of the kaiju. This time, Kafka was being chased to his death. At this point, Kafka in his kaiju form was bewildered and unsure of what to do. Ichikawa also called on his elder brother to make peace with the old man. That Ichikawa guy, being in kaiju form, asked people to laugh, frightening the old man to the point of fainting. Kafka was also worried that a slight touch to the wall would break it like a biscuit. In this kaiju form, all his strength had been enhanced to an unimaginable level. That noise had attracted everyone, making everything worse. Because of his concern, Ichikawa urged Kafka to run faster before the defense force arrived. Kafka followed suit, gently pulling the door, but it seemed like he wanted to destroy the entire building. Because he wasn't at ease, Ichikawa also followed Kafka to help if needed. Both ran wildly out of the hospital to find a hiding place. Kafka hadn't yet mastered his strength, his body constantly changing. Hungry, his body even caught a bird to chew, making Ichikawa feel nauseous. But it was also thanks to eating the bird that his body improved. However he got a strong urge to pee, and Ichikawa urged Kafka to endure, but how could he endure in this form? Kafka didn't even know if he had a bladder, so he tried to urinate to see. But why did the water flow not come from below but from his two nipples, making him want to collapse? Who could understand this humiliation? So he wanted to reincarnate quickly. Ichikawa tried to encourage him, saying it's okay, you have two urine holes, the faster, the better, so Kafka reluctantly continued on. At that moment, a loud noise made them slow down, perhaps another kaiju was appearing on the other side. By some miraculous means, Kafka knew that this kaiju was of the same species as the one that attacked them before. Ichikawa thought this was an opportunity for them because the defense forces would be distracted. It sounded reasonable, and Kafka was about to leave, but his conscience didn't allow it. On the other side, a little girl was in trouble as her mother got stuck. Just as the two were preparing to become dinner for the kaiju, Kafka delivered a powerful punch. He couldn't imagine how strong the punch was just now. He approached the two and encouraged them, then helped lift the obstacle. Ichikawa arrived and escorted the two away because it wasn't safe here. The beast that was knocked away managed to stand up and returned for revenge. This time, Kafka wanted to punch even harder, the strength was surging inside him. As the kaiju charged, he unleashed a punch with all his might, turning the creature into flying chunks of meat. Seeing this, Ichikawa thought if Kafka used this strength against humans, it would be catastrophic. Covered in kaiju blood, Kafka scared the little girl a lot. Kafka, knowing this, reassured her, saying that the defense forces were arriving soon, and he would disappear, so there was nothing to fear. As he turned to leave, he unexpectedly received thanks from the girl for saving her mother. This reminded Kafka of Mina's gratitude, awakening his desire to accompany Mina as promised long ago. With that, Kafka transformed his head back into a human form and declared that he would survive. Later, Mina's team arrived and was shocked by the scene. She asked the girl about the kaiju, and learning the situation, she was astonished by the girl's request to spare the kind kaiju that saved her mother. A week later, news of the special type of kaiju spread everywhere, and they gave this kaiju the codename number 8, corresponding to the 8 special kaiju species that had appeared from past to present. Ichikawa continued working as if nothing had happened, truly a comedic sight. His senior colleagues congratulated him on being selected to become a guardian. Kafka also received a letter of acceptance, which Ichikawa personally delivered to him. Kafka was working early in the morning, cleaning up the kaiju's remains alone, completely unaware, and calmly eating his meal in his kaiju form. Fortunately, the one who arrived was the beloved younger brother, if the defense force had come, it would have been disastrous. Since then, Kafka has gradually adapted to the transformation between his two forms, kaiju and human, but he still hasn't mastered it completely, so occasionally, he loses control. Thinking back to that dark night, fortunately, the two brothers weren't suspected of anything because the hospital was chaotic. Knowing that he had passed the first round of selection, Kafka wasn't too happy because he had failed in the second round before, leaving Ichikawa speechless. Although he knew he would be in danger if his kaiju identity were exposed, since becoming a kaiju, he had a strong determination to pursue the shadow of that girl. He was determined to become a guardian. About 10 days later, the successful candidates for the first round went to the second round examination venue. The defense base here was extremely spacious, serving as an emergency evacuation site for civilians in case of need. If he accidentally transformed into a kaiju during the exam, it would be game over for him this time. 
At that moment, a blonde girl who looked quite arrogant approached and called Kafka uncle, which seemed appropriate given his aged appearance. Ichikawa had to admit that it was true. The girl wanted them to leave because they were parking in her lucky spot. Since Kafka didn't cooperate, she took matters into her own hands, using her armed gear to effortlessly lift the car carrying the remains of the two brothers and threw it away. She introduced herself as Kikoro, with a hobby of hunting kaiju. Moreover, she also sensed the kaiju scent on Kafka, which terrified him immensely. Ichikawa heard this and immediately ran back, explaining that they were just kaiju corpse cleaners, so having the kaiju scent was natural. Before he could fully recover, Kafka rushed back and lifted the van up. What the hell? Uncle, you also have personal combat attire? Kafka said triumphantly, then turned to Kokoro and declared, I am Hibino Kafka, don't forget my name, kid. As he was making his statement, the butler backed the Mercedes into the parking space. Witnessing Kafka's incredible strength, Kikoro declared that she would defeat him in the selection exam. As Kikoro's figure faded away, Ichikawa appeared and asked Kafka if he dared to transform his body. Well, you know. I only transform my arms, so no one can see, Kafka replied. Just then, the call from the guards saved Kafka from further interrogation. However, Ichikawa was still angry, the kid declared that if Kafka dared to use his strength again, he would kick him straight home. Standing in front of the headquarters, Kafka promised himself that he would overcome everything to stand by Mina's side. However, the harshness of the physical test woke Kafka up. Despite maintaining his training intensity, age had held him back, making it difficult for him to keep up with the younger candidates. Currently, the second round of the exam would consist of two parts, the physical fitness test and the aptitude test. The aptitude test would examine natural talents, so no matter how hard he tried, Kafka couldn't change his natural abilities. This meant that Kafka had to score very high in the physical fitness test. However, the signs of decline due to reaching 30 years old had caused him to lag behind. Now, if he used his strength, he would surpass others, but it wouldn't be fair. Kafka ranked 219th out of 225 in the physical fitness test results. Meanwhile, Kikoro sat smugly at the top of the leaderboard, not forgetting to taunt Kafka, oh dear, are you Habino Kafka? You told me not to forget your name, right? The humiliation made Kafka cry, covering his face. When Ichikawa arrived to comfort him, Kafka pretended to be magnanimous and began crying and regretting using his strength earlier, which had now landed him in the top 10. On the other side, Commander Mina had recognized Kafka's presence through the records. This year's selection exam attracted many high-quality candidates. Leading the list was Hachi Izumo, the top student at Tokyo Monster Control University, followed by Iharo Furuhashi, a young talent from Hachiuji High School. The rising star of the Interior Security Bureau, Aoi Karagari, topped the physical fitness test. He had declined a bright future at the Bureau to join the Defense Force. Many other candidates came from famous military schools, aiming for high-level management positions rather than being soldiers. However, they all stood behind one person, a young girl with outstanding natural talent surpassing everyone. The youngest student to graduate from the Monster Control University in California, the girl Kafka had argued with the morning, Kokoro Shinomiya, approached him with a smirk, noticing Kafka's stunned expression. Do you want to continue showing off, old man? Kikoru teased. With your level of skill. Who would let you? Suddenly, a guard ran over and punched Kafka, warning him not to lay a finger on Kikoru. After being punched, Kafka rose to his feet, declaring that he would defeat Kikoru today. Just when Kafka thought all hope was lost, Ichikawa approached and shared the information he had overheard. For the past two years, the aptitude test had required candidates to clean kaiju corpses. Thank God, I thought what else, but cleaning up kaiju carcasses is my expertise, and the judge for the aptitude test is the deputy leader of Squad 3, Hashina. He declared the rules of the game as follows, contestants must defeat this buffalo-headed monster. Alright, it's over, Ichikawa, you said the test was about cleaning up that kaiju corpse? I might as well fail the test. Seeing Kafka lying on the ground out of fear, Kikoro couldn't help but laugh out loud. To protect the contestants in the upcoming test, the defense force will provide them with combat suits worn by the guardians. These are made from kaiju tissue, so they will significantly enhance protection and combat abilities for the wearer. However, not everyone can fully unleash the suit's power, in previous exams, most contestants could only unlock up to 10% of its potential. The top candidates this year included Ichikawa at 8%, Furohashi at 14%, Ai at 15%, Izumo at 18%, and finally, the pinnacle of expectations and historical in the Guardian selection exams, Kokoro, at 46%. Seeing Ichikawa looking rather sad, the deputy captain tried to console him, saying that 8% wasn't a small number. As long as it's not 0%, there's still hope, and we haven't seen any percent cases yet, the deputy said with a smile. 
Just as he finished his sentence, the staff announced Kafka's score, 0%. While the deputy captain burst into laughter, the 32-year-old man was still practicing his internal energy. The more Kikora waited, the more impatient she became. She couldn't understand why the old man had hidden his strength. Maybe he wanted to reveal it in the next aptitude test. The final test skull was a central kaiju surrounded by 36 smaller ones, blocking the candidate's path. Each person would be given an unmanned drone for tracking. If a candidate's life was in danger, the guards would remotely activate the defense suit shield. However, that also meant they would be eliminated. When the command was given, Kikoro quickly jumped between buildings leading the group of candidates, swiftly killing a secondary kaiju and then another nearby one. Kikoro's incredible speed left everyone amazed. Meanwhile, Kafka was left behind without the support of the combat suit, making the weapons he carried extremely heavy. Just then, the deputy captain announced that Mina was also observing. Kafka, upon hearing this, felt as if he had just taken a dose of doping. Ignoring the weight of the suit, he focused entirely on his ultimate goal. Upon reflection, why were they each being observed by a drone? If the goal was simply to kill Kaiju, wouldn't it be easier to just count the numbers? This indicated that the judges wanted to see how each person fought with their current abilities. Both Ichikawa and Kafka had low combat abilities, so their task was to support the others. Understanding this, the duo quickly approached the battlefield to analyze the secondary kaiju. Kafka had dissected it once before and knew it had very sensitive hearing but extremely poor eyesight. Kafka fired a flashbang and threw it toward the kaiju, rendering it immobile. He shouted to Azumo to shoot it in the abdomen, as the skin there was thinner than in other areas. Sure enough, after a few seconds of shooting, Izumo destroyed the first monster. The duo continued forward confidently, with Kafka relying on his knowledge of kaiju, determined not to use the power of kaiju 8. Suddenly, a kaiju charged at Kafka from the side, grabbing him and throwing him far away, causing severe injuries to his body. The system announced that he could no longer continue to fight, so the deputy instructed to prepare to activate the shield. Not wanting to be disqualified, Kafka exerted all his strength to stand up. He didn't want Mina to see him in such a sorry state. Just then, Kikoro appeared, shooting down the kaiju to rescue Kafka. She saved him simply because she didn't want him to withdraw on her battlefield. Just lie there and tremble, old man. Let me clean up everything nice and tidy, she said, highlighting the immense difference in the impact of the combat suit on weapon strength. Every shot Kikoro fired was a final blow to the secondary kaiju. At present, Kafka's leg was broken, rendering him immobile. The deputy also warned that his bone was broken, so moving would cause severe internal injuries. As a judge, Hashina advised him to withdraw, as the shield layer couldn't offer absolute protection. But Kafka struggled to stand up. He alone would decide whether to give up or not. He had risked his life his whole life to fulfill this dream, so even if he died, he wouldn't give up. Thank you for watching the entire video. Don't forget to click the subscribe button, like, share, and also hit the notification bell to receive updates when the channel releases new videos. Thank you.